Welcome, everybody. This is our seventh organization of biological field stations, OBFS, live from the field event. My name is Carrie Winninger with Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry. We encourage you to view past recordings and learn more at thevirtualfield.org. For those of you who are instructors, be sure to visit thevirtualfield.org to access supplementary materials for your students, such as an instructor guide for Live from the Field events with suggested assignments and an event resources document full of publications about the specific research topics and projects being discussed today. Very quickly, here are some guidelines for this webinar. Remember, all participants are muted and your video cameras are off. During the presentation, please use the chat button to communicate with us and each other. And remember to choose all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments. During the presentation and the live Q&A session with researchers, please submit your questions using the Q&A button, not the chat. If you're here as part of a college class, please type the word student in front of your question so we can prioritize it. And it's important to make sure your full name is visible, either as your Zoom username or typed in after the word student so you receive credit for attending. Also, welcome if you are watching us streaming live on Facebook. We'll try to get to your questions too. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. Tasha Commandant, Conservation Science Manager with Pepperwood Preserve. Tasha is conservation scientist with over 15 years experience developing methods, tools, and science-based solutions that inform natural resource management decisions. And we're very fortunate to have her moderating this event today. Thanks, Carrie, and thank you all for joining live from the field. We welcome classes, faculty, and other participants from across the nation and around the world. This is the seventh live from the field event. In this series, we take you on virtual field trips to research sites around the country and the world. As you'll see today, we are visiting three biological field stations and marine laboratories, places where people from many backgrounds come together to study the environment. Live from the field events are a project of the virtual field, an international coalition of over 50 field stations and marine laboratories. This National Science Foundation funded effort brings the field to you. Find out more about events like this and other virtual learning experiences for college students at the virtualfield.org. Today, we're gonna get a look into the work of five scientists doing applied research and field work that addresses societal challenges. And by applied research, I mean that they work on questions and systems that try to solve specific problems and provide innovative solutions to issues that affect individuals, groups, or society at large. So we'll see examples of how humans can work with farmers, fishermen, industry to better understand scallop reproduction and manage those populations. And we can learn from nature's design and help build better buildings and shorelines. And lastly, we're gonna look at how data information and building partnerships can make our communities more resilient to fires and floods. So I'm really excited and honored to get to moderate this session of Live from the Field and introduce you to some examples of how science and field research directly benefit people and communities. And I hope this panel stimulates your questions and ideas. Each researcher has prepared an eight minute video describing their applied science research. After the videos, the researchers will be available to answer your questions live. I'd like to encourage everyone to post the questions in the Q&A as we go along. Students, remember to type student and your full name in front of your question. So the Hurricane Island Center for Science and Leadership is a 125 acre island in Penobscot Bay, 12 miles off the coast of Rockland, Maine. They integrate science, education, applied research and leadership development through year round educational programs and a seasonal environmentally sustainable island community. 
Hurricane Island would like to acknowledge, honor, and make visible that these lands are the ancestral lands of Native people. And the researcher you'll hear from first is Phoebe Jekilek, a PhD student at the University of Maine and the Director of Research at Hurricane Island. She's been conducting research there for six years and will be take, talking to you today about science industry partnerships and population dynamics and interactions of aquaculture and wild species. One of her favorite parts about field research is literally immersing herself in the work and sharing the hands-on experience with learners of all ages. Hi, everybody. My name is Phoebe Jekilek. I am the Director of Research here at the Hurricane Island Center for Science and Leadership in Penobscot Bay, Maine. Um, I carry a few degrees. I did my undergrad at Boston University. Um, I have a dual master's in marine biology and marine policy from the University of Maine. And I am currently working on a PhD in ecology and environmental science at the University of Maine. Um, so my discipline really is marine ecology and I do a lot of fisheries and aquaculture related work. Um, I'm very inspired by the people that live on and make their livings um, from the ocean. Um, so I'm really interested in doing applied research that can contribute to our working waterfronts, um, contribute to our coastal communities, um, and inform work um, that we're doing here along the coast of Maine. Um, what has led me to where I am today? It's been a long and winding road. And the road continues, and I'm not sure that it will ever stop. Um, I hope it doesn't, because I've had a really great time so far, and I've been really privileged to do a lot of amazing things. Um, my first field experiences were in college. I did the BU Marine Program and the BU um, Tropical Ecology Program, and those were my first experiences doing field work and really connecting what I was learning in a classroom or in a lab to what was actually happening in the world around me. And so that was really, um, really influential and really just helped me see myself doing this kind of work. Um, it was field science that really drew me and um, it was really being out in nature and making observations, working with people, um, being on fishing boats. It was those hands-on kind of immersive experiences um, that really led me to the kind of science that I, that I do now um, and that I'm privileged to continue doing and um, I just get to work with so many amazing people in an amazing places like Penobscot Bay, Maine. So I'm, I'm really very lucky. Um, I also spent time on an island off the coast of California called the Catalina, well called Catalina Island. And I worked at the Catalina Island Marine Institute for about five years. Um, that is where I learned what it means to be an educator. I learned that I have a natural love for education um, and that it really energizes me and inspires me. And that's the first time that I got to really practice what I learned um, through experiential science learning. And I really got to share that with people. So it was pretty amazing. It's where I learned a lot of hard skills too. Um, I learned to drive a boat. I learned to scuba dive. Um, I learned soft skills like communication, um, listening, doing a lot of listening. Um, and I was really lucky to work with a lot of different people that would um, come out to the island. Uh, for really hands-on learning experiences. So I'm pretty passionate about both education and science. Um, and here at Hurricane, I'm lucky enough to be able to do both of those things um, while working with amazing people in our local communities. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what that looks like for us here at Hurricane. As I said, I work for the Hurricane Island Center for Science and Leadership. Our mission is to integrate science education, applied research, and leadership development through year-round educational programs and a seasonal, environmentally sustainable island community. May through October, we welcome middle and high school students, adult programs, colleges and universities, and visiting scientists to our island campus. This campus is also home base for the majority of our research efforts, of which I'll talk to you about today. We are located in the heart of lobster country in Penobscot Bay, Maine, and are part of the Fox Islands Archipelago. The island itself lies about 12 miles off the coast of the mainland, so Hurricane relies heavily on boats for all of our transportation and a lot of our work, and very little gets done without a lot of teamwork. 
So before I dive in more deeply about our research, I think it's really important to mention that there are very little research efforts, no matter where you are, that are done alone. The vast majority of research, and especially that that happens on Hurricane, needs a team to make it all possible. This is our team, myself, Madison, and Carl, heading out to the north end of the island to our 3.2 acre aquaculture farm where we grow scallops. Maine has a growing aquaculture industry along its coast, and scallops are one of the species being cultivated on farms. They're grown in different gear types, and we keep some of our scallops in cages that sit on the bottom, like the one you see being pulled up here. Our research focuses on evaluating gonad ripening and spawning cycles in sea scallops on aquaculture farms and in the local wild populations. This is one of our lantern nets where we also keep scallops and where farmers grow them. We are working to see if there are differences in the timing and magnitude of reproduction or spawning in scallops grown in lantern nets versus scallops that are found in the wild population. Here you can see a female gonad, which is red, and a male gonad, which is white. So we collect males and females each week, July through September, on our farm and two other partner farms to dissect them to measure their gonads. This tells us how close they are to spawning. We also use an instrument called a sonde to conduct a vertical profile of water quality on the farms. This instrument collects pH, solved oxygen, chlorophyll, turbidity, and salinity data throughout the water column. You can also see Carl collecting a plankton sample in the background. Maddie's going to tell us about another piece of data that we collect. This is a Niskin bottle. It's a way to collect water samples. Uh, we can prop it open and then when I send down this messenger weight, it will hit a trigger and the ends will both snap shut and this lets us collect water samples at a specific depth. So right now we're doing it right at our site and we're just trying to collect water from right near our nets and we're going to analyze it this winter looking for scallop eggs mostly. This data is also part of an environmental DNA or eDNA project with the University of Maine to detect scallop spawning events. So once we've collected the males and females from the nets and all of our farms, we bring them back to the island to dissect them. From each scallop, we measure the shell height, the total viscera weight, viscera are guts, the gonad weight, the meat weight, and the shell weight. In this video, you can see the scallop that has been dissected. The red part is the female gonad, which holds the eggs, and that big um, kind of tannish is the meat. As I mentioned, we work with other farms around Penobscot Bay as part of this project. One of them is Penn Bay Farm Scallops up in Stonington, Maine, owned by Marsden and Bobby Brewer. We visit their farm each week to collect our water samples and plankton samples and to take our scallops from the nets hanging on their farm. They not only give us scallops, but the farmers we work with help us identify research questions, like the one we're evaluating, and also share their knowledge about scallop farming. They're invaluable collaborators and have been fishing and farming along the coast of Maine for generations. They're scientists in their own right, and we could not do our work without them. Each week, we also collect scallops from the wild population to monitor GSIs to compare to our aquaculture scallops. This is a video of a scallop in its natural habitat on the bottom of the ocean. They like to hang out in cold, deep water on sandy and or shell hash substrates. We collect them using scuba, and we also conduct population surveys of the local populations while we're at it. In this video, you can see us moving along the transect line where we collect data on scallop size and abundance, associated flora and fauna, and also the substrate that they're on. The data we collect from wild and aquaculture populations is helping us understand differences in biology between them and also how reproduction on aquaculture farms may, may be contributing larvae to wild populations. We also partner with commercial harvesters and the Department of Marine Resources to get samples from commercial scallop vessels and their annual surveys. Farmers, fishermen, and managers are essential partners to conducting our work and making sure our research will be useful to scallop industries in Maine. Great. Uh, Pepperwood Preserve encompasses 3,200 acres in the Mayakamas Mountains north of San Francisco in California, within the traditional homeland of the Wapo people. We respect and honor past, present, and future generations of Wapo and their continued connection to this land, and are grateful for the opportunity to gather in such a beautiful place and give their respect to its first inhabitants. Pepperwood's mission is to inspire conservation through science. Dr. Lisa McKaylee is the president and CEO at Pepperwood, where she has served for over 11 years. She believes that you can't understand nature without exploring it directly, and that together we are resilient. 
She is joined today by Carlos Diaz, principal engineer with Sonoma Water for three years. He likes applying cutting edge science and research collaborations with local and regional partners to gather data to better manage water resources now and for, for the future with a changing climate. They will speak to us about providing real time fire, flood and drought hazard data. Welcome to Pepperwood Preserve for Live from the Field. My name is Lisa McKaylee, and um, I'm the President and CEO at Pepperwood. And today I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Carlos Diaz from Sonoma Water, who will be part of our conversation today about how we are partnering with water agencies to share uh, climate resilience data and help develop real-time warning systems. Carlos, could you tell a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure, my name is Carlos Diaz. I'm a principal engineer, civil engineer in California. I um, also consider myself an environmental hydrologist. Um, I'm a principal engineer overseeing the design engineering group at Sonoma Water, uh, but on the heels of the 2017 fires, was really tasked with advancing a lot of um, gauging systems and trying to collect the real-time uh, monitoring that was needed um, just to better understand conditions out in the field and Lisa and Pepperwood Preserve have been an incredible partner um, in facilitating us uh, deploying our systems. Some of the, my biggest inspirations have been uh, some of my professors along the way. So I uh, did, um, I became passionate about water resources um, as an undergraduate up at Humboldt State University and uh, continued uh, my pursuit of um, under better understanding water resources. Uh, planning and management uh, with a master's at Stanford University. Um, I have a background in private consulting, um, dealing with uh, not only infrastructure, but also um, really delving into hydrology, hydrolog hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, um, and flood uh, management. Um, and so that's, that was kind of my background before I, I came to uh, Sonoma Water at Sonoma Water. Um, it's a little bit of everything. We provide water supply to 600,000 people here in Sonoma County. We also manage uh, 10 sanitation districts uh, spread out throughout the county and we're also responsible for flood management. So it's really been a culmination of a lot of uh, my life's pursuits and passions. Yeah, and I have a lot of interest shared with Carlos. I um, am a river scientist and a watershed scientist. My background was more in physical sciences. Um, one of my biggest inspirations was a oceanographer, geologist, uh, Susan Humphreys, when I got to work on an oceanographic research vessel, who really got me excited about earth sciences and um, just studying how our earth evolves over time. Um, I came to Pepperwood with a strong interest in downscaling climate futures. Um, we had a partnership with Sonoma Water. I was just telling Carlos our very first grant actually was to um, help develop future climate projections um, to inform water supply and habitat restoration and other kinds of work. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about history and uh, we're excited to share what we're doing with you. So Carlos and I are standing in front of the very first uh, weather station with soil moisture monitoring that we installed at Pepperwood in 2010. And it's part of our Sentinel site network where we use the preserve as a living laboratory to understand our key scientific question of how is climate changing both over time and space in our landscape. Um, we have uh, over 17 full blown weather stations with soil moisture probes on the preserve now. And we also have micro met stations at 54 different long term forest monitoring plots. Um, but interestingly, um, when we started collecting this data, we didn't realize how valuable it would be to our partners at Sonoma Water. And so Carlos, could you talk a little bit about the value of this kind of soil moisture data, especially when we're dealing with climate hazards like droughts? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as Lisa mentioned, they're really pioneers um, in terms of, you know, starting to collect the real valuable data needed for, you know, water resources planners and managers to better manage our, our water resources. And um, soil moisture is really a critical component of that. Um, Lisa had mentioned um, some of the climate change and just understanding how um, our, our watersheds and 
hydrological cycle is changing um, in both time and space and collecting this data is really critical um, to establishing you know our conceptual framework for how our you know hydrological systems and ecosystems um, are reacting to a changing climate um, and we're really fortunate um, for having partners like Pepperwood with the foresight to uh, begin collecting this data and uh, begin establishing these long long-term data sets. Okay, could you provide an example of how soil moisture data might inform um, how you manage the reservoirs that are part of our uh, water system or perhaps um, the Russian River, which is really our main water source for over 600,000 people? Yeah, absolutely. So soil moisture is really critical um, in understanding how, you know, any rainfall event um, is going to be divvied up in between recharging, um, you know, our lands um, or turning into runoff. And so it's really critical to not only understanding flood response, so, you know, understanding what soil saturation levels are prior to a rainfall event, um, gives us really good insight into how we might um, anticipate um, that rainfall turning into a flood event. Um, if we have saturated soils, you know, nearly 100% of that rainfall is transformed um, into runoff. Um, and on the flip side, it's also really cr critical to understanding um, drought. This year is a really great example of that where um, we've just had such dispersed rainfall events um, of, you know, only half an inch, three quarters of an inch at a time. and and uh, the soil moisture has been so depleted that you know most of those rainfall, most of that rainfall um, ends up recharging um, the 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 soils and groundwater and really turning into very little runoff. Um, so we haven't had the the response in our reservoirs that we would have anticipated um, in in the winter due to soil moisture conditions. And so, under again collecting this data um, allows us to better understand the dynamics of how our reservoirs function and. Um, the long-term reliability of our water supply. Carlos, I'm so excited that you're going to be able to explain what this brown tube is sitting here at Pepperwood as part of One Rain System. Yeah, so this is um, this is one of our rain gauge sites, uh, one of the 22 sites I mentioned earlier that were installed around the Tugs and Nuns fire footprint. Um, this here is just a standpipe. Um, the top section of the standpipe here uh, contains a tipping uh, bucket. Uh, that's how we measure uh, rain in time. And we've also got a, um, a solar uh, panel to recharge the battery and an antenna that beams this data in real time to Mount St. Helena, where we have a repeater. And that repeater uh, bounces the data back to um, the water agency headquarters. And so what we have here in the standpipe is the actual transmitter itself. Wow. And so it's a lot of wires, but basically all we've got here is um, the battery I mentioned uh, contained within this unit, solar power to charge the battery. We have a GPS um, that allows um, all the gauges to be on real time. That's really critical so that every gauge knows exactly when to be transmitting data and they're not stepping on top of each other. So the GPS is a global positioning system that's talking to the satellite? Talking to the satellite and making sure that all the gauges are on the exact same time. I guess the other partnership we should talk about, Carlos, is just the fire camera network. We've talked a lot about water today, um, but could you just share a little bit about along with our emergency awareness around floods, how we partnered around the fire camera network? Yeah, so the fire cameras was um, another initiative that grew out of the 2017 fires and just um, the need to uh, identify these fires um, before they became, um, you know, so large that there's really nothing you can do about them. And so Cinema Water um, initially funded eight cameras um, that was the genesis of, of the North Bay uh, fire system. And we I, were the first two. Yeah, and Pepper <laughs> were, were the first two cameras. And not only do the agencies look at the data, but all of our local communities now have real-time information on the location of fire and fire spread. And that was really a game changer when fire came to our property again in 2019, um, that Cal Fire knew where to hold the lines. They actually came and fought the fire here at Pepperwood. And in 2019, the fire was prevented from getting into our urban areas. So Carlos, it's been so rewarding for us at Pepperwood to be in this relationship with Sonoma Water. 
and to see our data getting used for really super important climate resilience challenges and benefiting everyone in our community. Yeah, I think one of the benefits of the fires um, was just kind of convening um, all sorts of different organizations and agencies and groups and nonprofits in the county um, and convening at the table and, and determining you know, what the questions were, what the problems were, and how we were going to go about answering those. Um, fostering those relationships long term um, in order to uh, collect the data necessary. Um, you know, it not only benefits us in terms of managing our water resources, uh, planning and management, and helping us answer questions um, that we have in order for us to do a better job, but that data is also available to countless researchers who may be um, advancing science and our understanding of the dynamics of uh, drought, fire, and flood. Great. The University of Akron Field Station is a living laboratory for the advancement of knowledge through ecological research, education, and stewardship of the natural world. It covers 540 acres on three different sites in Northeast Ohio and wants to make visible that these lands are the ancestral lands of native people. Tibu Wet and Elena Statue are both PhD students of integrated bioscience at the university where Tibu also serves as a teaching assistant and Elena is a biomimicry fellow. They have been working at the field station for two years and like getting back out and appreciating nature, studying organisms in their environment and sharing their research and thoughts with the public. They will tell us about their research projects studying root systems for bio-inspired design of building foundations and coastal infrastructure. Hi, I'm Elena and this is Thibault and we're both Integrated Biosciences PhD students in Dr. Petra Gruber's Biodesign Lab at the University of Akron. And today we're here at our university field station, which is in Bath Nature Preserve a local nature preserve for the community, and it's only about 20 minutes away from campus for us. Hey, so Thibaut here, I'm a French architect, and in addition to the PhD, I'm also a teaching assistant for natural science biology labs at the University of Akron. For the PhD, I'm studying biomimicry for architecture, and just in a few words, biomimicry is basically the transfer of biological organism strategies to technical systems, so we are looking at how different organisms are going to perform different functions and adapt to environments so we can abstract those strategies and transfer them to uh, our technical systems towards sustainability. And for the PhD, I'm studying mainly two different topics. The first one is growing fungal mycelium on agricultural waste in order to make sustainable building materials. And the second one that we're going to talk about today is looking at the morphology and growth of root systems in order to design better foundation systems. Hey, it's Elena again. So I'm a local engineer um, from the Midwest. I grew up both in Michigan and Ohio. And also while I'm doing my PhD, I'm a biomimicry fellow with three organizations, Biohabitats, Food and Water Alliance, and ODNR Office of Coastal Management. So I work part-time with them on design and engineering projects, bringing a biomimicry lens to that work. And I also get to do some field work also, which is pretty cool. Um, so I study for my PhD biomimicry for coastal engineering, specifically for the Great Lakes. And I look at tree species that exist along rivers and coastlines, specifically their root systems and how they stabilize the shoreline and protect the shoreline. One issue is that there is currently a lack of consistent biological root trait data in the literature. Uh, so it's difficult to compare results between studies and find trends. So we are working on a technique to uh, get 3D models of root systems uh, to have this kind of automated process to analyze biological root traits. And to get the 3D models, we're using uh, photogrammetry, which is basically taking a lot of pictures from different angles of one object, in this case the roots, and then we upload those pictures to a software that will reconstruct the 3D model virtually, and then we can analyze this 3D model. 
Uh, and to use this technique, we really need to increase the accuracy to get consistent uh, data from the root model and also increase the accessibility so we can use it in the field. So we want the most accurate 3D models of these root systems so we can get things like root branching angle, root length, and root diameter to inform the designs of our different engineering applications. So first in the field, what we'll do is we'll measure all around the root wad, root length, root diameter, so we can compare these in-field measurements to the measurements we get on the computer with the reconstructed 3D model. And you can see these different treatments here where we're trying to improve the reconstruction. So there are markers, colored markers on the roots. We've got powder, which is just flour from the grocery store to really enhance the object in the photos. Today is a really cloudy day, which is great, so we get very minimal shadows on the root system when we're taking the photos. So we'll take the same 3D model across different treatments and compare those in-field measurements to the computer measurements. And with this process, we're working with Claudia. She's an undergrad biology student, and she's helping us with this comparison process. So we're also working on the accessibility part of this technique because the goal is that anybody around the world with their own imaging devices could come to a root system and they would take pictures following a specific procedure and then they could upload those pictures to a database where we could reconstruct a 3D model. Uh, but it's pretty difficult to actually image complex systems in the wild. So it was really great to start at our local University of Akron field station where we could actually experiment with the technique, for example, using a phone, a digital camera, or a drone, testing also different marking techniques, and use the space and tools that we have here at the field station. So for this project, talking to experts has been really helpful, both in root biology and in photogrammetry, especially to help optimize this technique. And while the study is still ongoing, we've learned some key findings. One is that the number of pictures taken, as well as the addition of powder specifically and markers, seem to help with the accuracy of the reconstruction of the 3D model. And the type of camera used does seem to make a difference, but we've noticed phones that have really good quality cameras give us really good 3D models, which is helpful for the citizen science process. So this has not been a linear but an iterative process, so for the last two years we've been optimizing this technique, like getting slightly better each time, and we still are getting some uh, mixed results between different experimental groups, uh, because our technique is uh, slightly affected by the weather, for example shadows, or even like the wind moving some parts of the root system. And in some cases, we also cannot access all around the root system to take the pictures that we want. But ultimately, the results of this technique will actually lead to more sustainable um, bio-inspired design for building foundations and also coastal infrastructures. In the case of uh, building foundations, the goal is to actually adapt the morphology of the foundation system to different environments. So for example, in cities, we want less soil compaction to increase water infiltration and have less flooding. In environments like slopes, on slopes or coastline, we actually want to prevent erosion. So the goal is to kind of integrate also multifunctionality so we can also store resources and share them between buildings, but also with the environment. And in the case of coastal infrastructure, for me, um, a lot of the practices used today are really old, traditional, um, and a lot of the infrastructure displaces natural habitat, like oyster reefs and wetlands, which provide a lot of great ecosystem services. And something as simple as like a rock pile or concrete wall in front of someone's home can cause downstream erosion issues for the next door neighbor. That same concrete wall, if waves are crashing against it, can churn up the water, make it cloudy, so it's really harder for really hard for plants and fish to thrive. And so a lot of issues are caused by current infrastructure, which then is solved by even more engin engineering solutions, which completely changes our coastline. So what I'm hoping to do with the study of root systems is start to re-naturalize our coastline by creating bio-inspired infrastructure that mimics nature and form, function, and material. And so what's really great about the field station, since it's open to the public, we can interact with people talking about our different research applications in the study of root systems. And in this video, we've hope, we hope you've learned something from us today and about our research. And let us know if you have any questions. Thank you.
Great. Now it's time for the panel discussion and Q&A. Please post questions for the researchers using the Q&A button rather than the chat. Our college classes have a time constraint of 50 minutes. So we are initially going to give priority to those questions. And after that, we'll answer questions from other attendees until the top of the hour. And as a reminder, students, please type the word student before your question and make sure your full name is visible. The panelists are going to try and keep their answers uh, to a minute or less so we can get through as many of these great questions as possible. It's great to see all your faces here. Those were such great videos, everybody. Thank you for making those for us. Uh, for the first question, um, let's get us started by hearing from all of the panelists. So briefly, I'll ask the same question and you can answer one after another. We'll start with Phoebe Jekalek, move on to Lisa McKaylee and Carlos Diaz, and then finish up hearing from Thibaut Wett and Elena Statue. Okay, can you tell us or remind us, uh, what drew you to studying applied science questions in the first place? Um, well, I think I mentioned some of it in my video, but I just, um, that it was that hands-on aspect first in my undergrad that really drew me to doing things in the field. And then after I graduated from undergrad, um, I started working as a fisheries observer. So I would go on commercial fishing vessels offshore um, and collect bycatch data, collect biological data from um, their catch. And so working with fishermen and hearing a lot of their um, stories and a lot of their input and their experiences in fisheries, that really started getting my, my wheels turning about um, the importance of doing science that is tangible to the communities that you're living in um, and to our coastal communities. So it was really, it was both uh, the exposure to the field and then also the exposure to working with a, a, a whole crew of scientists in their own right that I had never worked with before. So um, it was really that working with fishermen that kind of pushed me to think more about um, going into applied science. I think Lisa, you were next. I can go next. Um, so I started my career at the Environmental Protection Agency. It was my first job out of college and I was an entry level uh, environmental scientist there. And working for the agency, I saw a lot of PhDs coming in to promote projects with pretty significant impacts on the environment. And so I wanted to pursue my um, graduate work so that I could work on restoration ecology. Um, I didn't know that climate change was gonna be such a big issue in, within my own career, um, but to be able to have a PhD to work towards um, projects that benefit the environment. Um, so I was a little bit different. I definitely, I was a different kind of PhD student. When I went to graduate school, I was an older student compared to most of my peers. And um, many of them were gonna be on an academic or university pure research track. And I knew right from the start that wasn't my interest. Um, most of my PhD work was focused on very applied river, river restoration research questions. Um, so, and I just feel like around 2007, while I was working on these very large river restoration projects um, that were very expensive and required many people to contribute land and money and time, um, planning for the future and realizing that my training did not really prepare me to um, design a project for the next hundred years and that I needed to get educated about climate science. And I think that surviving climate change is the biggest challenge we're going to face as a planet and a humanity. And where we live, water security and limits on water, I think is the, one of the most serious climate change problems we're working on. So water security, I think is something that um, motivates me because it benefits people and plants and animals. That's a tough one to follow up there, Lisa. Um, hey folks, it's Carlos Diaz here with Sonoma Water. Um, I think one of the, well, several experiences um, during my undergraduate career uh, certainly led me to um, kind of the pursuit of, of, uh, of my degree and my career. Um, I would strongly, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with Phoebe. Um, I think just those hands-on experiences for me, there was several internships along the way, um, working with USGS and Redwood National and State Parks and just understanding the, the breadth and kind of multidisciplinary nature of a lot of the problems up there. So in the Redwood National Forest, they were dealing with 
um, legacy logging roads and this just perpetual kind of sediment supply um, from failing roads and failing crossings um, that were, you know, really detrimental to uh, fisheries ecology um, and biology up in the area. We have a lot of um, endangered salmonid species um, that utilize a lot of these these forest streams and and uh, you know something as as simple as you know them needing um, a mathematical or optimizational approach to understand kind of how to spend their limited budgets um, and maximize kind of the benefit or the impact um, that they were able to have um, through their programs and so um, the biologists. Um, here, the biomimicry folks will like this, but we were applying a genetic algorithm. Uh, it's a type of optimization um, programming uh, methodology to uh, determine how to maximize sediment savings and, and basically keep that sediment out of the streams um, in, in an uh, effort to uh, you know, restore the landscape um, and, and streams up there and, and have kind of the maximum benefit um, for uh, for fisheries restoration up in the area. Okay, so for me, um, coming from the field of architecture, it was actually pretty straightforward, like studying applied science. Um, I'm really interested in, to look at how our research can affect uh, society and how we can go towards sustainability. So my goal is kind of using uh, the research and biomimicry in general to actually design more sustainable solutions. And throughout the years, I've had the chance to work on multi projects um, at different scales, for example, the like a classic building component, but also looking at how resources are shared inside the building, but also with the environment. So seeing how we can uh, change the impact that buildings currently have on our environment. And one also key aspect is to look at the life cycle of buildings in general, but also the urban environment. So what do we do when um, urban environments decay or buildings decay? Can we restore them? Can we modify them? Can we bring back uh, natural environments and so on? And for me, in uh, undergrad, I studied materials and polymer science engineering. So essentially how we make anything in our society, where those materials come from. But I was really involved in sustainability in college. So I got to work a lot with the communities surrounding my university in Cleveland. And I really saw this, uh, you know, this potential to work with people in different organizations um, to also solve problems that engineers you know are dealing with every day um, especially how we interact with our environment like how our structures interact with the environment um, and I had a bit of an interesting uh, gap between undergrad and um, <laughs> my PhD uh, but I so I was uh, I worked for a sand mining company uh, for a couple of years and I did some uh, field work with engineers that borders doing uh, water treatment projects in Panama and Honduras. So, you know, I was just exposed to a lot of different experiences working with a lot of different communities of people and just saw how, you know, industry was impacting the environment, but also how industry, you know, with corporate sustainability initiatives and everything wanted to kind of rectify the impact they were having on the landscape. So I with this kind of funky background I have of like engineering and industry and working in the field, I went back for my PhD um, to really look at applied science and design. So like science and biology and design and really get myself familiar with just like the natural history of the Great Lakes region. Um, I've gotten much better at identifying native plants and trees. Um, so just, you know, developing those biological skills to really enhance like what I can do as an engineer to impact society in a positive way. This next question goes to you, Phoebe Jekilek. Um, this is from student Brandon Vigil. Um, it says, Dr. Jekilek expressed her passion for field research at the beginning of her video. How much time does she spend in the lab and analyzing data as opposed to collecting it? 
Ah, uh, the age old question, Brayden. Um, and just so you know, I'm working on my PhD, so I'm not a doctor yet. I want to be super clear about that. I am, I'm just a, finishing my first year of my PhD. Um, so I still got a while to go, but I'm getting there. Um, so that's a really good question. I think one that is an, on a lot of people's minds. Um, I have continuously chosen opportunities that keep me in the field. Um, and that is part of the uh, fisheries and aquaculture work that I do. It is one of my interests. Um, you know, I learn best in the field and literally seeing things for myself and doing things for myself. And so um, when I can be out in the field, I can um, grasp concepts much better. And when I'm out in the field working with people, I can understand um, essentially, you know, what they're learning and seeing as well much better, which really influences my um, my science and the way that I think about the work that I do. So I get to spend a fair amount of time in the field. Now, granted, I live in Maine and we don't, well, actually this year we did dive year round. Um, but, you know, there are seasons that are more computer oriented or more lab oriented. Um, and then, you know, seasons that are more field oriented and I'm moving into a field season. So that's really great. And also, you know, my PhD is working with environmental DNA. So that is a lot of lab work. Um, so that is kind of a new world for me. I'd never done genetics work before. So that is a lot more lab work than I'm used to. But again, um, it's a great balance. I'm really lucky to be out in the field as much as I am um, on the island and doing the kind of work that I do with fishermen and farmers. Thanks, Phoebe. For the students that may have to leave now, thank you for joining us. We will email follow-up information. And for other attendees, the panel will stay on through the top of the hour and continue to answer your questions. Um, this one goes to uh, Dr. McKaylee or Carlos Diaz. Um, it says, do you think there is any way to ever prevent the forest fires? That is a really great question. And um, the answer is we live in a fire adapted ecosystem. So our ecosystem actually needs fire to be healthy. For over 14,000 years, indigenous people to this area used fire as a stewardship technique. And so the landscape really evolved with um, humans burning quite regularly. Um, until last year, I would have told you that um, humans are the main source of fires, whether on purpose or by mistake in our landscape. Um, by suppressing fire and trying to prevent fire from happening, we've actually made the risks much more severe because the forests are too thick. They're like thickets and the understories have lots of baby um, Douglas fir trees in them that had we continued to use fire or let fire burn, um, they wouldn't be there. Last summer, we actually had lightning fires, lightning ignited fires. Um, and that's new to our area, it's not very common. Um, so up till then we felt like if we could control uh, things like power lines and the other human caused um, things that start fires, either infrastructure or uh, irresponsible behavior, that maybe we can make a headway. But now if lightning is also gonna be a factor in our area, then we definitely have to be prepared for fires to start and be stewarding our land to reduce the hazards. Um, so no, I don't think we can really prevent fires all the way. We need to learn, we need to relearn how to live with fire safely. This next question goes to Elena and Thibault. Uh, they're wondering if there's a particular species of tree that has more structurally sound root systems. Should I start off with that, Thibault? <laughs> okay. So uh, for our, um, so there are trees that are hardwood and softwood. So for, you know, if you're thinking about um, just trees that will last a long time and will decay more slowly, um, hardwood trees will last longer than softwood trees. But if you're thinking about the other element of that is there's a species level difference, hardwood and softwood. Um, but also if the trees adapted for a continual, oh, my lights clicked on in the lab, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> uh, there's also, if trees are adapted for like continual like flooding inundation or water inundations, um, those trees are more adapted to deal with these like periods of water fluctuations as well as like living on slopes or coastlines. So 
For our work, we've focused our efforts on riparian tree root species. So trees that like live along streams, rivers, and coastlines that are native to our area. So native to the Lake Erie watershed. Um, so that's really where our application lies. Did I miss anything, Thibault? Yeah, and just to add a little to that, uh, in terms of the structural capacity of a tree, you have a you have a difference between if they live if they are in a forest where you know all kind of trees help each other to mitigate wind and forces that are applied on uh, the root system, whereas if they are alone in a field, um, they just take all of the forces from the wind on their own. So, for example, oak trees are usually uh, more structurally sound in the field, like on their own, compared to other species that would be overthrown uh, otherwise. So you have some differences between species, and as Elena said, it also depends the angiosperms, the gymnosperms, and their basic like anatomy. Um, so yeah, there's a, a, a difference between how they handle forces. This question is for Carlos. Could you talk a little bit more about the fire cameras in the Bay Area and say um, if there are other organizations or locations where these cameras are located? Great question. So as far as I know, you know, Sonoma County employed the third kind of regional system of these, these cameras. There had been two prior systems, one in the Lake Tahoe Basin and one down in the San Diego area that San Diego Gas and Electric um, was managing um, more in relation to their, their power infrastructure and, and um, transformers and transmission lines. Um, so since then, I, I know the number of systems has exploded here in California. I have heard inklings of some, some networks uh, being installed up in the Oregon area as well um the the systems have grown considerably and i know the um the science behind the systems has grown incredibly as well i think um just the other day i heard or it was in the paper that um they're now uh implementing artificial intelligence so training machines to look at the camera um, feeds as opposed to relying on you know either the public who might happen to catch it on the feed first or you know we've also got cal fire and and different emergency management officials that that are watching that but um being able to train computers to identify um you know sources of ignition and being able to convey those coordinates um to uh responding officials um so as far as i know california and oregon are are the two i'm familiar with lisa i'm not sure if you're familiar with others. Well, I think part of the question too is it really has been a partnership. Um, one of the challenges for the, the network is finding sites to, to utilize. So Sonoma State also provided um, a site, I believe, and um, I'm not sure Carlos how the others were cited, but it is a very collaborative effort um, of multiple agencies working together and, and um, landowners providing access for, for the work. And it is very exciting. They're talking about being able to with the artificial intelligence basically help map perimeters by using multiple cameras simultaneously staring at the same fire and starting to get sort of a 3D picture of where that fire is and how fast it's moving. Wow, there are so many great questions coming in. Um, so really quickly, if you could give us the 30 second spiel, this is for Thibaut and Elena. So this is a long question, but a short answer. So this person wants to know, um, they said biomimicry is a fascinating field of research. I'm curious about the process of developing a project such as your exploration of tree roots. So does a company reach out to you with a problem and then you explore a solution? Or do you first brainstorm a useful application through a project, then reach out to a company who might be interested in funding it. So it's both. So I'll answer one way and Thibault will answer the other way. So for me, because I work part time, uh, primarily with biohabitats, it's an ecological restoration firm. Uh, the I worked with my company to identify the problem. And then I came. So the problem being like coastal erosion on Lake Erie, and continually hardening our shoreline with concrete, rock and steel. And so um, 
And we use large wood a lot in river and stream restoration projects, but in urban areas like where I live, there's just not access to large trees to be able to do that kind of work in coastlines. So that's like where I came at from my work is came at the problem. Um, but Thibaut, I think is flipped in many ways. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, it's actually uh, before the PhD, I read a book called The Hidden Life of Trees, and it's talking a lot about the roots and all of the crazy things they do. And it's so inspiring, especially from a non biologist point of view. And then uh, when I started the PhD, I really wanted to study roots. And then I found this uh, kind of analogy to uh, foundations in buildings. And by studying the roots, we discovered all of the potential that there is to design better foundation systems. And so it, it kind of started the other way around, like looking at a root system, then identifying uh, the problem solution, like the problem uh, environment, which was the foundation systems. And then kind of going back and forth between both, like finding solutions in uh, root systems, finding problems in um, foundation systems and how we can tie both of them together. Great. Last one for you, Phoebe Jekulek. Um, if you can answer in the short amount of time we have left, that would be great. There's two in here. Are you measuring the impact of water temperature on reproduction in scallops? Um, have you found any larva from the farmed population in the wild population yet? Both really great questions. Um, short answer is yes, um, because we are collecting data on three different farms in three different areas of Penobscot Bay and in wild populations, we'll be able to take the environmental parameters that we're measuring and um, connect them to the biological data that we're collecting from, from the scallops. So that will definitely be something that we're gonna be looking at. Um, are scallops spawning in response to a change in water temperature, a change in dissolved oxygen, a change in salinity. Those are some of the things we're gonna be able to look at. And then um, the larvae from the farm population, really great question. That is um, a part of another project that we're doing with uh, Dr. Paul Rawson from the University of Maine and his graduate student. Um, we have some biophysical models that we're plugging our spawning data into. Um, and then we're gonna be collecting spat, which are baby scallops. Um, and then also, so we're gonna be collecting spat and genetic information from those baby scallops um, based on, uh, we're gonna be sending the spat bags based on where the biophysical models tell us the larvae will be traveling from a farm. And so then we'll take genetic data from the farm, also take genetic data from the spat bags um, when we deploy them based on where the models tell us to deploy them and see if there are matches. So that is a question that we're, we're in the process of getting to. Really great questions. Wow. I love all these questions coming in. I am going to end, even though we're one minute late, with one that I love to end with, which is about how to get students involved. So I'm going to give this one to Lisa, but anyone else can jump in, keep it real quick. Just about students who want to get involved with perhaps these projects or just research in general. What's your advice? I think students should always feel welcome to contact research stations. That's why we're here. We can't always accommodate requests, but based on what your project is or what you're interested in, um, we can help connect you with some of our visiting scholars who might have similar interests. Um, we have very strong partnerships with our junior colleges and our local school districts as well. Um, so I, I would recommend, you know, you can reach out to any of us if you're in our area um, or the Organization of Biological Field Station has a map and a list of field stations all over mainly the US, but also the world. So you could look and see if there's a field station listed there and say you found out about them through this series and you wanted to learn more. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you to our speakers, Carlos Diaz, Thibaut Huat, Phoebe Jekulek, uh, Lisa again, and Elena Statue. We want to thank the Organization of Biological Field Stations and the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University. Learn more about their series of virtual events at thevirtualfield.org and cei.sonoma.edu. And thank you to the National Science Foundation for funding this project and to all the wonderful people behind the scenes who made it possible. We will be emailing all of you in the next few days with a follow-up answers to the questions that weren't, we weren't able to address today and a link to the recording of this event and a link to a very short survey 
how you use the event, what you enjoyed, other event themes you might be interested in, and suggestions. This is here to help us find funding and improve these for the future. You can also find a link to this survey in the chat if you'd like to copy and paste that into a browser when we say goodbye. Please share the virtualfield.org and our recorded events with fellow instructors, students, friends, and colleagues. Past event recordings are accessible on the Live from the Field page under Virtual Visits, where you will also find links to the websites of each site featured today and event resources, including publications from each researcher and educational tools. Thank you and goodbye from the field. Panelists, please wave goodbye.